welcome back to the course. Today we'll be adding a nice little debug window to our game to keep track of some internal variables while we play. We'll also be adding some animations to our player to bring them to life just a little bit more. Now debug windows are actually extremely useful. Being able to visualize some of the internal variables as they change as we actually play the game really lets us fine tune things, figure out any bugs that we need to find and kind of just tweak. It's just really useful. Now this will actually be part of our UI, but it will be toggleable and only available within the debug build of the uh, game. So only we really have access to it. That way we never have to do any odd coding shenanigans to remove it from release and we don't actually give anybody who plays our game access to information they don't need. So let's actually dive in and just figure this out. We're going to need two things open. First one is we're going to need to go to our UI container for our HUD, open the scene. And you'll see here that we've got our normal UI container with our coin counter. Just keep that open. We're going to need it anyway. And then we're going to go and add a new scene or create a new scene at the top here with the little plus icon. This will be of type user interface. So it'll be a control node. We are going to be calling this the debug underscore UI. Let's hit control S and we'll go save this under scenes under UI and save it there. And all we actually need for this is a label. So if you hit Control A to add and then you type in label, it'll pop up with a label for us. Now let's actually look at where we want to position this thing, right? If I go and click play, we've got kind of empty space on the left side beneath the coins, but we've got a lot more empty space up here. And I feel like this is going to be a preferred spot. Usually when you're kind of placing a window like this in, you're going to want it on the side that you're not consistently moving towards. So that'll be on the left side. That way you can always see what's coming. And we'll have the ability to kind of move it around as much as we want to as we go anyway. So for now, I'm just going to be placing it in the top right corner here. So to do that, all we have to do is something really simple. We have to go to the presets for the anchor and then click top right corner and it will lock it to the top right corner. Make sure your control node for the debug UI is actually uh, in full rect mode. You can come up to the anchor here and then just click the full rect button. It will full rect it for you if it isn't. But if it is, then you can just go change the labels positioning to the top right corner and kind of just be good with that. Now I'm going to write out kind of a bunch of nonsense here just to get a kind of a view of how this is going to look. The fact that that is off center kind of bothers me a little bit. Now let's go and kind of set some mins and maxes up for this. If you are following along with everything that I've set up so far, which includes some of the uh, project uh, settings for the window configuration, which is the viewport width height and the uh, window width and height override scaling stuff. If you're following along with that, then these settings will work for you. If not, just have a fiddle with it until it feels right for you. A lot of this is really just up to you on how you want to place it and where you want to put it. Say if you want to put it on the left side, you can just pin it to the left side like so. I want to do top right corner. We'll be in top right corner. So now all we have to do is go and give it some a custom min max. We have to do some things with the text and kind of just go from there. So let me pull this out so we can kind of see everything. First thing we're going to want is the auto wrap mode. We're going to want that on word. You can do word smart or arbitrary. I just prefer to keep it on word. That way it only wraps the text on words specifically. Horizontal alignment will be left and the vertical alignment will be the top. I'm going to come down to clip text. I'm going to turn clip text on because we want that on. And that's pretty much it. We can just leave this stuff as is now. So if we scroll down to the actual control node part of this and go into the layout, we can give it a custom minimum size in the X and Y. For the X, I'm going to use 120. And for the Y, I'm going to use 280. Now you'll notice that's just a little bit bigger than what we've currently got. That's fine. Got the anchors and the anchor presets done. And final thing that we want to change, of course, will be in theme overrides, font sizes, and our font. We want to go and set that to eight pixels. Now that looks like it's going to be a little bit small. And if I click this again, yeah, it, it looks like it's going to be a little bit small. That's actually okay because we're going to want a lot of room here to display enough text or kind of enough of a gap to display long text. And you'll kind of see why as we go. Now, uh, clicking run project won't work because we actually need to add this to our HUD. So let's go back to our HUD, go to the margin container, we'll click on that, we'll hit control shift A to add, and we will add the debug UI. Now that's added it into the top right corner for us. Let's hit control S and save. Hit play, it's always a good idea to actually test this stuff. 
I like that positioning. I like where it is. There are some things I'd like to do to the font real quick to make sure it actually kind of pops out a little bit more and makes it a little bit easier to read. Now to do that, we have to do is click on the label, which I'm going to rename to the debug LBL. That way I know it's the debug label. Now I'm going to come down to the theme overrides again. I'm going to go to constants and I'm going to add a outline. Scroll in a little bit. It's going to look a little bit odd in editor, as you can see. You're going to want to kind of keep it uh, of like as multiplicatives of two. So two, four, six, eight. From that, it kind of looks a little bit better when you do it like that. Uh, go to the colors here. Go to font outline color. Click that. See, once again, it looks a little bit odd. If we go into the game and test this, it looks a little bit better and it pops a little bit more. Now, we can, of course, up this to... 12 in the font size, but I think that's just a little bit too big. So I'm going to keep mine at 8, hit Control S and save. And that is the very foundation for our, or the uh, node foundation for our debug label. This is something that we will change a lot as we go in the future, as this kind of version of it gets, becomes a bit unwieldy, or that becomes a bit too much in it, we're going to be changing it to a more modular system in the future. So for now, let's go to our debug underscore UI and then we'll add a script to it. And it will be the debug underscore UI script. We're going to give it a class name, class underscore name. Now, when I create debug specific things, I prefer to keep their class names in all caps. It's just a habit of mine. You don't have to do that if you don't want to. It's just a thing that I like to do. Now we're going to need a reference to our debug label because we're going to want to change this. We'll type it as a label as well. And now we're going to need access to our ready function. So the first thing I want to do here is have our debug UI actually check if this is a debug build. Now, the, there are a lot of OS specific commands to kind of test this. And all we have to do here is write if, and then OS, capital O and capital S, dot is underscore debug build. Now, what this will do is it will check if this is either running in the editor or it's running on a debug build version of the game. Basically, if it's using the debug binary, and it will kind of, if you uh, control left click on it, you can kind of show, it shows you what it's doing here. Return is true if Godot binary used to run the project as the debug export template or when running in the editor. So this gives us access to this only in editor. That's kind of what we want. We only want access to any of the code in here in editor. Now, I'm going to go one step further with this and I'm going to do some of my own checks and set up a Boolean for this. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to write if os.debugbuild does not equal true. So if it is not true, i.e. we're not in a debug build, I'm going to write pass. And then up the top here, I'm going to make a new variable. So it will be a var. And this is just going to be called is underscore debug underscore enabled. There we go. Typecast it as a bool, set it equal to false to start. There we go. So what we're going to do here is we're just going to be changing this boolean. We're going to go, is this a debug build? If it does not equal true, i.e. if it is not a debug build, okay, then we're going to guarantee that the is underscore debug underscore enabled is set to false. And then, then we can just return out of that. Then we can do an else statement and go else is underscore debug underscore enabled equals true. And then once again, return out of that. Now, all this is going to do for us is just, depending on what build we're in, it's just going to change this Boolean to true or false. Now, technically this Boolean and this check isn't actually necessary. We don't need to do this. Is debug build already does this for us, but I prefer to have something that I've coded myself so I can just kind of keep track of things as I go. So technically you don't need to do any of this. This is just kind of a redundancy thing. Now with that done though, let's go and create a new function. Well, we're going to need access to the process function, not the physics process function, just the process function. I'll uh, give you a little tip here as well. We won't be using Delta. So this will throw this little warning every time we run the game. What we can do is use an underscore before delta, and it will make sure that warning never appears, because this is kind of saying, ignore this variable. We won't be using this variable. We can ignore it. 
So we now have access to our process function. We are going to uh, move into uh, setting up the toggle system now to actually start showing our UI, i.e. Showing, uh, showing and hiding it. Now to do that, we're going to create a new function. This is going to be called func toggle underscore debug underscore UI. It won't take any parameters and it will be of void return type. And we're going to just do some if checks here. We're going to go if input dot is action just pressed because we're going to press a key right now issue with this is we don't actually have a key created so let's come back up to our project now uh, top left here project project settings go into the input map add a new action i'm just going to call it debug and then i'm going to click a plus here and then i'm going to assign it to the equals key on my keyboard because i don't use the equals key in games that often so it's kind of an out of the way key you can assign this to whatever key you want to use for your debug for me, equals works. So now what I can do is I can go if input dot is action just pressed debug do something. Well, what do I want to do? Well, I'm going to want to just simply toggle the debug UI on and off, which is changing the visible variable on the debug, which you can do with toggle visibility up here. There is a hide function to actually hide the uh, UI itself, but we want, don't want to do that. We just want to do some toggles. So we're going to do some interesting checks. We're going to go if visible is equal to true, set it equal to false. So visible equals false, not true. There go. And that will toggle us from true to false. And then we can just go else visible equals true. And this is just a really simple toggle for us. Now, one thing that we can do in here is to make sure it works. We can use a quick uh, print statement. We can just do debug underscore enabled. Hit control S and save. I'm going to throw the toggle debug UI inside of our process here. Hit save one more time, hit play. And you'll see it's in the top right corner. If I hit the equal sign, it disappears. And if you look at the uh, output down here and I hit it again, it enables. And now I can do this as much as I want and it runs completely fine. That way we can kind of have it in the frame if we want it in the frame or if we want to kind of move to a different part of our game and then start testing from there, we can just disable it because we may not need to see it there. And then we can move forward. So with this toggle debug UI setup, we now want to move up back on, oh, back up into our ready function. And we're going to want to set the visibility of our debug UI to basically invisible if this is in a debug build. So to do that, uh, when it, this does not equal true, we can just change the visible to false. Like so. So what I can do here is if I hit play, you'll see that it's enabled. Now, if I change the does not equal true to does not equal false, and then I hit play again, you'll see it disappears. We can still toggle it for now because we are in a debug build. And that's kind of one thing that we also need to sort out, right? Is we're not actually checking, we're not using this Boolean anywhere. So we can still toggle it even if we are in a debug build. And that's fine. We want to be able to toggle it in a debug build, but we don't want to toggle it if is debug enabled equals true false. So to do that, we can very simply either go into our process here and set a check for if debug is enabled, or we can, actually we could just do this, if is underscore debug enabled is equal to false, there we go, return. This will basically stop our process from running anything that it uh, wants to run and that way we can just have that check running all the time. Now I can press the button as much as I want and it will never enable the is, or it will never enable the AI. So let's go change that back and make sure that it all functions fine. And there you go, all works fine. Now, the next thing we're gonna to wanna to do is kind of have what I like to call a master function, which is gonna contain a lot of the other functions and run a lot of the other functions. So to do that, I'm going to come above the toggling of the debug UI. I'm going to write func handle underscore debug. That's not how you spell debug. Debug underscore statistics. There we go. Statistics. I can spell. You can just call this handle debug stats if you prefer. 
doesn't need any uh, parameters and can return a void type. And then what we can do is just take everything in the physics pro or the normal process here, and we can just throw it into handle debug. And then we can just call handle debug stats in the process. Once again, a little bit unnecessary, but this tells me here that the process is going to run a function. The function it's going to run is something that handles all the debug stats, and that includes toggling the UI and a few other things. Perfect. Now let's actually go and set up a kind of way of setting our text. To do that, we're going to come to the bottom of our script, add a few new lines. We'll uh, create a new function and we'll call this set underscore debug underscore text because we are going to be setting the text of our label here. This type of code separation is really useful because this is one of those, this will be one of those function that's, uh, functions that will get very long until we refactor it in the future. And we're going to need to check something, right? So one of the things we're going to want to kind of check, one of the hidden variables that we don't actually have access to view is our player state. We could do print statements to check that and that's a thing, but we don't really want to do that. What we can do, however, is give our debug UI access to our player variable or our player entity, and it can just do some checks from there. So to do that, what are we going to need? Well, first we're going to need a new variable here. So var, and we'll call this the player underscore entity, and it will be of type player entity. We'll set it equal to null. Then we're going to need to actually go and connect to a signal. Now this is a really cool thing about how we've set up our signal bus in the past and how we started using signals at the start. If we actually remember correctly from our camera here, this connects to a signal for on player ready. And it, then it sets the target of its, or it sets the, its own target to whatever kind of gets passed through. In this case, the target is of type player entity. And that, type, that player entity, of course, gets emitted from our player. So we already have a signal set up for this for on player ready. So we can go back to our debug UI. In our ready function under the else here, we can call our signal bus, and then use dot on underscore player ready dot connect, and then we can connect this to on underscore player underscore ready. Then we can use control shift and the left arrow to copy or highlight the whole row, and then a control C to copy. We can scroll all the way down create some new lines below the set debug text because this is a uh, function for a signal. Set it as a void return type. This does take parameters. Remember, it takes a parameter of type player entity. So we're just going to call this the entity. And then we'll set that to the player entity class type like so. Now in here, all we have to do is set our player entity equal to entity equal to the entity. Now that's setting our player for us. Now we actually have access to our player within this script. So to continue back into our set debug text here, we're going to need to do a check. We're going to need to check if the player entity is equal to null. Now, why are we doing this? Well, if our player dies, then the player will no longer exist. And if the player no longer exists, this will throw a bit of a error. It will be very unhappy because, well, the player doesn't exist anymore. It doesn't know what to do. It's trying to pull variables that don't exist anymore. They'll just crash it. We don't want that. So we need to do this null check to make sure that doesn't happen. And all we do in that is just type return. And now it will no longer throw that error if the player stops existing. Now we're going to need to do a few separate things, right? We're going to need to one, figure out how we want to do our debug label, and two, figure out what values we're going to want to kind of have in our player or in our uh, debug label here. The ones that I'm thinking of will be the player state, its health value, its velocity x and y, and some in-game uh, in -game gravity just to so I can keep all those numbers in my head without having to go back and look at them all. So to actually start setting up our debug text, we are going to need to first grab our debug label, and then use the dot text to access its text. And we want to set that equal to an empty string. So empty string is using a double quotes to kind of just open the string up. Now, what do we actually want to place in that string? Well, this is 
where it gets kind of dependent. It depends on what variable you want to go first, right? So I want to have the gravity to go first. So I'm going to call this the world gravity, like so. Then I'm going to use a colon as some like just added uh, beautification, I guess. And now to actually allow us to kind of be able to format things correctly, we need to use the dictionary kind of opening squiggly brackets here. This will allow us to uh, actually kind of place in uh, code or variables that we want to place into it by doing it like this. Now, the reason that that's going to happen is because we are going to use the dot format functionality. And you'll see here, string format, values, variant, placeholder, string. So in here, you'll see string and it has the squiggly brackets and a little underscore, so squiggly brackets and a zero. That's telling us kind of how we want to set it up, which means we now need to actually open up a, we're going to open up an array inside of this. So to do that, we're going to use square brackets. And inside this array, we can just kind of start placing the variables we want to use. So for world gravity, I can just grab the player entity dot gravity handler, and then I can grab the dot gravity. And I'm going to put a little comma after that so we can go into another new line. I'm going to hit control S to save. I'm going to hit play. And we'll see how this runs. And you can see up there in the top right corner, we now have our world gravity of 600. But that doesn't really change, so that's not really helping us. It's grabbing the variable, but is it consistently updating? Well, let's go into the next one. The next one will be the player. Let's do the player state. Now, every time we add to this, I'm going to add a new line here above our uh, array. So I can just have like an empty line here, just so it's easier to read. Every time we want to add to this, because we're going to want these on individual lines, we can use the forward or backslash n here to give us a new line. And then we can write out what we need to write out. So in this case, let's do the player state. Same thing with the uh, colon. Now we can use the accessor again. Instead of zero this time, we use one. So let's go back into our actual array of this. Grab the player entity dot, uh, what's the player state machine dot current state. I'll put a little comma there again. Now I'm going to show you something really quickly because there's going to be a little error with this or a little issue that I have with this. So this will work. Let's uh, go and open it. And you can see here, you've got player state, player idle state, and then you've got the node and it's changing the states, but it just looks kind of odd. So to change that, after the dot current state here, we can use dot name. That will grab the name of the actual state itself. There we go player walk, player idle, player jump, player fall. Now this is actually updating depending on what we're doing. Now, a little refactor that we uh, kind of missed in the last video, whilst I'm here at least, is if you walk along and you jump and then you try to jump backwards, you'll see your player kind of keeps moving in one direction. And then uh, when it hits the actual falling state, it'll start moving backwards. We're gonna go fix that. And it's really simple to fix. We just go into our uh, what is it the jump state open the script here and we just need to make sure we are handling our movement when we enter the state and during the physics process so to do that we're just going to add a new line player entity dot uh, movement handler dot handle movement we'll pass in the player entity as we usually do Pla uh, pass in the player entity dot input handler dot handle movement input as well and then finally we'll pass in zero that handles it for that one frame that we are in enter state. Now we can copy and paste that line, pass in delta instead of zero. There we go. And we can, uh, yeah, this, this will basically make it so we're always handling our movement and making sure we can actually move in the air. A very quick thing to like make this a bit more legible. One thing you can do here is after the comma here, after player entity, you can use a backslash and then you can hit enter and it will give us a new line. And you can do the same down here. I showed this off in the last video a little bit. Just, uh, put three there. That way it's all correct. There we are. That way it's just a little bit more readable. It's all in uh, a small space and you can kind of tell, okay, this is part of this. This is part of this. Done. Control S and save. Let's go test it and make sure it runs. There we go. Now I can change directions as much as I want in the air and not have any problems. And of course, our state machine is now shown in the top right corner. So we can now debug what state we're in as we're going through the states. So you can see here, jump into fall, idle. If I go and fall off of a ledge, 
we stick in idle because we never actually added the ability to go from idle to full. But if we walk off the ledge, we go into the full state until we hit the floor. Now the idle or the idle into full we will fix in a later episode. As of right now, we don't need to do anything with that. It works as kind of intended. Now let's go back to our debug UI and let's add some variables for the next uh, bunch of things. So once again, slash n new line inside of the uh, debug label dot text. The next thing that we're going to want to add will probably be the player health. Be a good idea to make sure or at least keep track of the coin counter and the player health to make sure they're in sync with each other then we can do the colon open up our squiggly braces put a two in there go and add that to our script as well so player entity dot health handler oh wait we don't actually have an accessor for our health handler that's interesting so let's go back into our player entity let's go into the region that we have for our handlers We'll add the health handler into there as an on ready. Type it as a health handler so we get access to the IntelliSense for it. Go back into our debug UI, pull it back up, and there we go. Health handler dot current health is the one that we're going to want to grab. Let's go control S to save, make sure it works. It's going to be a lot of making sure things work. There you go, three. Now, there is a little issue or a fun little bug with the uh, code that we actually have here and I'll show you, uh, show you it now. You'll see here the coins go to zero, the health does not. Now I will be showing you how to fix that in a later episode. As of right now it doesn't actually make any difference. Like it genuinely makes no difference. It's more of a visual bug than it is anything else. So that's our player health. Let's do a backslash and then uh, do an enter and then do a new line like so. I'm going to indent this one. So uh, you can see here that this, this indentation is yellow. That's saying it's part of the string now. So the indentation is part of the string. That way it's just a little bit easier to kind of follow along uh, follow along with our text. So we have our gravity, player state, player health. I'm going to want the player velocity now. So I'm going to go player velo underscore x for our x velocity. I'm going to open my circle or squiggly bra uh, braces, put a three in there. I'm also going to do the velo y at the same time. So backslash n player velo underscore y. Open the squiggly braces, do a four. Now I just have to add these to the actual script themselves. So player entity dot velocity dot x is our first one and then player entity dot velocity dot y is our second one so let's hit control s and save and go and see something kind of interesting so our velocity is there's an odd space there i just like that we'll fix that in a second but our velocity is at zero and yet when we move up down and we jump you'll see here that we've got this really long string of numbers and that's because of how we're using interpolation to change that or to fix it at the very start of our player entity dot velocity dot y what we can actually do is use the round function so we can write round and then we can do round f because we are using a floating variable here and then encapsulate the player entity dot velocity dot x inside of those parentheses we can do the same thing for the uh, velocity dot y but we don't actually need to so now, jumping up and down, it's a full integer, left and right, a full integer. Nice. Now to fix that space real quick, I'm going to just figure out where that space is. Ah, there it is. And that is our entire debug label sorted. So let's just make sure everything works. So I can jump up and down, I can collect a coin, the health goes up, I can go get hit by something a couple of times, health goes down, states are working, uh, the toggle for it works. And that is the really basis of a like really quick and simple debug UI. Now, as we actually go, we'll add to this a lot more. And then by the time it starts to get like, you know, down here in text, we'll uh, start modifying it and making it a bit more modular. So we can just kind of add to it in a bit of a different way. And there'll be a couple of different windows rather than just one text box. So with that done, let's hit Control S and save and make sure we're all saved. Now we know how to add to this. We know how to kind of improve upon it if we want to. The next thing I want to handle, or go and do at least, 
is animations. Now I'm going to walk you through how to play some animation stuff and I'm going to show you a little bit of a pitfall with the current state machine that we're having. Now if you went and kind of experimented with the state machine a little bit you may have run into a few errors. There is a way of fixing certain issues. So one thing we're going to want in here is access to the animation player. So let's go and create an onReady variable for this. So we'll create this, there we go. So we now have an onReady variable for our animation player. Now, what's going to need access to this? Well, every single one of our states is going to want to be able to call the animation player and do something with it. Okay, so just kind of follow along with this one. Let's go create an animation. To do that, we click on the animation player and then this little animation window pops up. If it does not pop up, you can click the animation button. Let's go to the 2D scene, scroll in a bit so we can see. I'm going to disable the hitbox collection box and the collision shape. I'm just going to hide them. And to create a new animation, we're just going to hit the animate button or the animation button here, hit new. And the first one is going to be called the idle animation. You'll note that I don't have any capitals here. That's fine. Now we're going to click OK. And you'll see that you know, we have the animation, we have a new track thing, we have some time stuff here and sliders. What does it all do? Well, this is actually where uh, this, this can be like a lot of fun. I don't tend to use sprite sheets or things like that often. I use interpolated animation. Uh, Godot makes it very easy to do so. Now, the first thing we're going to want to decide is the idle animation. What are we going to want to do with it? Well, most of our animations, because they are specifically going to be controlled through our state machine, we can actually have these looping. So looping basically means this will forever play through. Now, if I hit the play icon here and you watch this little blue, uh, blue slider, it will just infinitely play through. That's fine. Because it's our idle animation, we're also going to want to make this auto play on load. So when our character first loads in, this is the animation it's going to play. Now, Let's have a quick look at some things, right? This here is the time, like in the top right corner here of the animations. This is the time it takes to do the whole animation. So this animation is one second long. This little slider down here, this little scrubber, is just the zoom, which we're going to want access to because that kind of makes things easier for us. Uh, you've got the snapping interval. So you'll see here it's snapping every one second. So this is the current time we're at. This blue line will snap every 0.1 seconds. That will be fine for our idle animation because we don't need to go too in-depth with it. Now, how do we actually go about adding tracks to this and uh, adding frames and actually making animate? Well, whilst we click our animation player and we're in the animation menu, we can go click on any one of our nodes and actually start doing stuff with it. I'm going to want to animate the sprite. So I'm going to click the sprite and you'll see in the top right corner of the inspector here that all of our kind of settings here for our variable, all of our variables here have these little keys next to them. This is the keyframe button so we can actually add tracks to our animation. Now, quick important thing, make sure that this scrubber is all the way at the zero mark before we uh, add any frames. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to go down to the transform of the node 2D, because that controls the transform of our sprite. And the only thing I'm going to want to animate in this is going to be the scale. So what I can do is I can click the little keyframe button, and it'll pop up with a confirmation window, or a confirmation window. It says create new track or property for scale and insert a key. Hold shift when clicking the key icon to skip this dialog. We don't really want to worry about skipping and things like that. I want to quickly go over and explain this specific checkbox here, the Create Reset Tracks button. The Create Reset Tracks button is extremely important and you usually always want this ticked. What that's going to do is basically make it so when we play what's known as the reset animation, it will reset our character back to its default uh, settings, right? So it's default of like 1-1 one, one scale in this instance, or the default sprite, or the default offset, which in this case is negative 12. So we kind of want to make sure that that's a thing. So we're going to need to be playing that reset track actually quite often. And I'll kind of tell you why as we go through it. So let's hit create. And now we have this new track here for the sprite and its scale. So at the very start here, so at zero seconds, what I'm going to do, pull that in a little bit, there we go, 
is I'm going to change the scale. I'm going to, actually, we'll keep the scale at 1.1. We'll go to 0.5 in our timeline, and then we'll add a new keyframe. And then once again, at the very end, to add another new keyframe. So we have three keyframes, and it should look like this for now. What I'm now going to do is click on the middle keyframe, or keyframe, so the one at 0.5, and you'll see this value pops up here. So this is going to be the value for our character's scaling. Now, I'm going to hit the unlock component button here so we can just uh, scale these independently. And I'm going to put the scrubber at 0.5. And now what we can do is kind of start messing around with these values. So they both start equally at 1.1. Okay, let's do two in the X and leave one in the Y. Let's see how that looks. Let's, oh, there you go. I click on the timeline and it makes our character stretch quite heavily. That's actually interesting. Okay, let's do four in the Y. Click it again. And now our character is really, really tall. Okay, so th that's kind of how this is going to start to function. Now, if I hit play, you'll see it. our character is kind of pulsating and growing back and forth. And it's a little bit kind of odd. So let's uh, change these values a little bit. I'm going to set them back to 1.1. Now I'm going to change the X. Let's change this to... 0.95 and then change the y to 1.05 that way they have this kind of very similar 0.05 difference in both sides that way it's equal and now our character looks a little bit more like it's breathing that's kind of great for an idle animation that's kind of what we want the one thing i dislike about this is it's got these really hard stops when it actually hits the point right it bounces it goes down and then it hits like a hard floor and then it comes back up and it hits a hard ceiling and it comes back down. I don't really like that. I like uh, to change my interpolation mode to come down here to the little yellow chevron where it says linear and cubic. I like to change my interpolation mode to cubic. That way it's got a kind this of, it's got this kind of like bouncy flow to it. It just kind of looks a little bit more natural than uh, nearest in this instance or linear in this instance. We could change it to nearest and uh, I guess if you're going for a pixel game, this is actually, you know, not a bad version of uh, this animation to use. This actually looks like it would be okay for a pixelized animation of the game. I'm going to be using Cubic. I just like the look of it. Now I'm going to hit pause. I'm going to double click that so it resets the track. I'm going to hit control S to save. And there you go. We have our animation. So let's go click play and see what happens. Well, if I full screen this, you can see here our character is animating. It's bobbing in and out, it's breathing, it kind of looks like it's alive. Perfect. We're going to want to make sure that plays in our idle state. So let's go to our idle state script. Let's go into the enter state functionality. Uh, under the set physics process true, let's grab the player entity, grab the animation player, then hit dot play. So we want to play. The first thing we want to want to play is the reset track. So what that's going to do is every time we move back into idle, it's going to reset all of our values to the default values or all our variables to their default values. So the character isn't weirdly stretched as it goes into an animation or a different or wrong sprite as it goes into an animation. So that we want to play the reset track. And now we're going to want to grab the player entity dot animation player dot play. And we want to grab the idle. There you go, non capitals, idle animation. I'm going to hit Ctrl S and save. I'm going to click play. Oh, it crashed. Why did it crash? Well, it says here, invalid call, non-existent function, play in base nil. So this is an issue you may have run into if you started messing around with how the uh, state machine works. Now, there is a reason this is happening, and it's actually a kind of obvious reason when you start looking into it a little bit. If I go back into the player entity here and I think about this, well, when the player entity actually becomes ready it runs the code to set the animation player and kind of connect the animation player to the player script okay but because of how godot makes things ready it goes children first the idle state and the player state machine specifically the player state machine doesn't know the player exists until the player is ready or at least doesn't have access to the animation player until the player is ready the way that this kind of bounces is it goes ready the full state, jump state, walk state, idle state, ready the state machine, and then the state machine goes, okay, let's go and grab this exported variable for the player. And it grabs the exported variable. It now knows where the player is. 
but the player doesn't have any of its current on readies set up and ready to go. What it's now got to do is go through all of our handlers, and then our handler container, then our animation player, collision shape, sprite 2D, then the player entity sets things to ready. So what's happening here is the idle state or the state machine isn't actually grabbing a player at all. Now to fix that, what we can actually do, or it's not grabbing the animation player at the correct time, that's what I should say. That makes more sense. Now to fix this timing issue, really simple thing. We're going to put a space between our health handler and our animation player here. And we're going to change this on ready to an exported variable for the animation player. We can just uh, change this line to make it of type animation player set it equal to null, hit control S and save, go to our player entity, assign the animation player in the inspector, hit control S and save, hit play, and there you go. Now our animations play perfectly fine and there's none of these issues. And that will also make it so anytime we want to play an animation in the future for our state machine, we won't have any issues. So a quick thing to just note, if you run into any state machine issues like that, make sure that your character like everything's kind of ready in the order it should be and if say your health handler doesn't exist well make make that an export variable in your player entity rather than on ready and then just assign it and go from there so that is our idle animation and our idle state sorted now let's move back into the animation player this is a 2d scene let's go and add a new animation so we'll click animation we'll add new we're going to call this the walk animation now I'm going to want this. What I like to do is set things to 0.6 to start. 0.6 is just a kind of a comfort zone for me because most animations don't really tend to go for an entire second. 0.6 just tends to work. Now I'm going to once again want to do the sprite. And for our walking animation, we actually do have a separate sprite for walking. So what I can do is I can grab the texture for the sprite here and I can hit create as a keyframe. I can grab this te uh, texture and because the very first frame I'm going to want is the action pose, right? Because if I set this as this frame specifically, you'll have two frames of your character kind of standing still and then one frame of your character actually in its power pose or its action pose. So what we're going to want to do is change the first frame to be that action pose. And for us, it's going to be tile underscore 0003.png. I'm going to drag that across to the value up here. There you go. Now, if I click on the timeline again, character is now jumping. Now at three seconds, I'm going to want to create a, another new frame for the texture. And then once again, at five seconds, another new texture or another new frame for the texture. Now in the very center frame, the middle frame, I'm going to want to set this back to 002. So our normal walking pose here. There you go. Now, if I set this to looping and I hit play, we now have this little jumping up and down bobbing motion. That's kind of perfect. One other thing we can do here is, you know, adjust the scale and stuff to make sure it kind of looks a little fine, which we could do. We're not going to worry about that for now, but this works. So that's our walking animation. Let's go and do the, uh, so we've got walking idle. Let's do the jump animation, not the uh, jump, the jump animation. Jump animation, I'm going to just set down to 0.3. Press and save, go to the very beginning. Once again, to get this to, uh... there you go, the uh, sprite reset. So that's the other thing is if say you're in the idle animation and you see here the character is stretched and then we go over to the jump animation, the character is still stretched. Go click the reset track, it'll reset your animations back to normal. Now we can grab the jump animation. So jump animation is really simple. Once again, we're going to grab the sprite, grab the texture, hit create, grab the actual keyframe itself by clicking on it. And we're going to go change this to the tile 0005 sprite, like so. So that is our jumping animation, which is just the red version of Aurelian. This is kind of a way of doing this so you don't have to go and create individual assets. This is just going to be very useful when transitioning between our states to just show what's happening. At the very end of this, we can kind of like polish it up when our game's ready to go into either like production or like full production or when we want to start publishing things. We can go back through this and change the just the sprites and the textures and things like that to be something a bit more customized and a bit more to our like to what we want. But for now, this will work for us. So we've got our jump animation done. 
let's go and finally create the final animation for our states and that is the full animation once again i'm going to set this down to 0 0.3 set this at the beginning grab the sprite keyframe the sprite and now i'm going to change the keyframe in here to let's do the yellow alien there we go so we have all of our animations set and sorted so let's hit control s and save and now we just got to go through our states here and actually set them up so i'm going to do a little uh, a little sneaky trick i'm going to go to the idle state i'm going to copy these two lines take control c i'm going to go to the walk state under the enter state function uh, just after handling our movement i'm going to paste those two lines i'm going to go into where it says uh, the idle here instead of idle i want to play walk take control s and save let's go into the jump state do the same thing after this little blob of code change idle to jump take control s and save and finally into the full state under enter state paste that in and change the text to full now what i can do is go click play see if anything crashes it does not oh, we can now move that's all nice uh we can jump and the frames don't actually seem to be resetting so we can go and kind of check our animations and see why it's not resetting well if i go into the script here you can see that we do have a texture reset and a scale reset but if i go into say the idle animation this doesn't actually have a kind of predefined texture so i'm going to now add a texture to the sprite here I'm going to go and make sure that the fool has a texture, which it does, the idle has a texture, jump has a texture, and walk has a texture. Now let's hit play again. Yeah, now that actually looks and feels a little bit better. Once again, certain things aren't resetting. Let's go and make sure they actually reset. Let's go into the idle here let's check our scale the scale is set to 1.1 for some reason it doesn't entirely always like doing that so what we can do here is go into our animation player and we can just add a scale keyframe to that so our scale is at 1.1 do the same for the idle which it already has the jump doesn't have one let's add a scale keyframe there and add one for the walk now let's click play make sure it's all working fine there we go now everything is resetting to how it should be every time we jump and fall we switch through now this is actually the coolest thing to me i absolutely love this with the state machine and the uh kind of the sprite stuff is when i'm walking i'm using the blue running sprite when i'm standing still i'm using the blue idle animation sprite but when i jump i actually transition from three different sprites i go from blue to red to yellow and it allows you to really easily see the exact moment that you start to go into a you know different state and that plus our little debug window here is extremely useful for when we want to do something and when we actually want to do something we'll be in the next video we're going to be adding player attacks into this and that player attack is going to be coming off of our full state so we're going to need to know when we're in the full state and then how long it will take for us to say go from the top of the full state down to the floor or at least a generalized timer for that and then we'll kind of look into adding like a goomba stomp type thing so we can actually stomp our enemies but for now that is actually all we have i hope this has helped i hope you have enjoyed uh, i hope you're having a great game dev journey and i will see you in the next video